Thanks, guys. Amen. Wake up! You can tell it's the Sunday after vacation Bible school because so many of us have that BBS glaze. And uh, I've had allergy problems all week. I'm taking allergy medicine. And so if the sermon gets so boring that even I go to sleep, please just exit quietly and leave me here on the pulpit sleeping. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Uh, I've had several people wanting me to say something about Matthew's haircut. I just did. (laughs) You get a haircut and they clap. It's just that easy. I don't know what to say. All right. So today we'll be back in the Gospel of Matthew in the uh, eighth chapter. So we've been talking about how when Matthew wrote his gospel, one of his purposes is to uh, communicate to us that Jesus is our king. Our king has come to us, the king of Israel, the Messiah, the promised one who was to come. He has arrived and he's brought his kingdom with us, with him, to us. So his kingdom is where his will is done in our lives. It's where his will is done in our relationships. It's where his will is done in our circumstances. So the kingdom of God is where God's will holds sway, where his will is done on earth, the way that it is done in his presence with the angels around his throne. So in the text that we're going to look at today, Matthew is going to emphasize the authority of Jesus and how disciples are to respond to his authority. This is an important subject, because in chapter 9, Matthew, the tax collector who wrote this gospel, is going to describe his own calling to follow Jesus and how he responded. Now, there's there's drama surrounding Matthew's calling in the way that he responds. And so it may be that Matthew is setting the stage to help his readers understand his own decision to follow Jesus. And uh, we'll look at that uh, next week. What you and I need to understand is Matthew appears to be emphasizing the fact that you and I should ask ourselves a question. Why would I follow Jesus? Every would-be Christ follower must have an answer to that question. Why follow Jesus? And it's relevant because I'm going to tell you that the culture in which we live today encourages us to have a much different answer to that question than the one Jesus puts forth to us. So why would anybody follow Jesus? Uh, Let's look at what Matthew says would say to us. Matthew chapter 8, looking at verse, beginning with verse 18. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said, but Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us! We're going to drown! He replied, You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. When he arrived at the other side of the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. 
They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the, into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to men. All right, so some of us will be drifting off here in a minute, so let me tell you uh, kind of the main point of the sermon. I'm going to suggest to you that I accept from Jesus the grace of what he has already done for me. That's what I accept from Jesus, the grace of what he has already done for me. But the reason I follow Jesus is because of who he is. And that is a message that goes counter to much of the church culture that you will find in North America right now. So let me say it again. What I accept from Jesus is the grace of what he has already done for me. The reason I follow Jesus is because of who he is. And that is the point of Matthew's text. So there's two things I want to tell you this morning. Here's the first one. Jesus is not inclined to accept half-hearted disciples. I can see you like that. See, again, this is not popular in church culture in our country at this time, where a lot of Americans think they can give Jesus what they want and claim him as Savior and King. And they are wrong, according to the text. Jesus is not inclined to accept whatever we choose to offer him of ourselves. Now it's true, Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God wherever he went, and it's true that he invited everyone to believe and follow him, but not everyone did, of course, and Jesus even turned a few notable people away from following him. Here's an example in the text of at least two men Jesus turned away. First, we see that the scribe wants to follow Jesus everywhere he goes. Jesus clarifies for him that those who follow Christ have only one true home. See, it says in the text that before Jesus can leave, two people express their desire to follow him across the lake. The first one is a scribe, literally a teacher of the law of Moses. He is a Bible scholar. He addresses Jesus as teacher, which is a title given to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew only by those who do not fully believe in him. Uh, it's a polite way of referring to Jesus without going all in. Teacher. It's an accurate title. It's an inadequate title. 
The scribe says he wants to go with Jesus everywhere he's going. But Jesus seems to know that the scribe does not grasp what such a commitment involves. And so Jesus clarifies for him the reality of things. Notice what Jesus says. God has provided homes for birds and foxes. And I think later Jesus will say that God has provided a home for his son and for everyone who is follow, who follows his son. But that home is not in this world. Let me say that again. There is a home that God has set aside for Jesus and for everyone who follows him. This world is not it. Therefore, Jesus chooses to live as a homeless man while completing his mission on earth. He is a stranger. He is an exile. He is a pilgrim. He is just passing through. And make no mistake, Jesus cannot and will not promise all the comfort, safety, and security of home until we get to that home. We are not there yet. So what can you not expect from the Lord God Almighty in this life? Comfort, safety, security. And if that's what you want from Jesus, you might as well leave now. You're not going to get it. Until you're with him face to face. Jesus promises disciples in this world, you're going to have troubles. Because this world is not our home. Are you following? Yes. I know this is not popular. <laughs> the second would be disciple reveals an underwhelming commitment to Jesus by wanting to choose how and when he follows. I know in verse 21 that it's true. This disciple expressed a kind of commitment to Jesus, but again, it's inadequate. It's just not enough. Jesus' response to him is strong and clear. To make Jesus Lord means I cannot be Lord. Hello. No amens there. But let me say it again. If Jesus is going to be Lord, you know who can't be? That's right. Therefore, I do not have the luxury of deciding when it is time or convenient to submit to the word, ways, and will of Jesus. I do not have the luxury of saying to my king, wait till it is right for me, and then I'll do what you say. You know what he says to that? No. Strongly, emphatically, Passionately, with all authority, if that is your attitude, my answer to you is no. That's right. This man wants to bury his father. It implies at the very least that the man wishes to postpone following Jesus until after his funeral is over and after the ending of the Jewish mourning period. To that, Jesus says no. And it's quite possibly this would-be disciple is using this expression as an idiom for let me wait until my father is dead. And if that's the case, he, what he's saying is I need to wait until it's more convenient for me to follow you. And Jesus is thinking, well, how long is that going to take? I mean, the drugs they have nowadays may keep your dad alive forever. Who knows? At any rate, other priorities are coming before following Jesus. He's wanting to wait until the time is right. Jesus says no. He suggests that there may not be a future opportunity. It's better to do it now and lose everything in the process, including his father. Many who are alive postpone their response to the direct call of Jesus because of more pressing human allegiances. And believe me, I've been doing this a long time. I've heard every excuse in the book for why people 
cannot do the will of God, live out the ways of God, and follow the word of God. Jesus' answer to that is, (laughs) it's not going to fly. Let me say this again. Jesus is not obligated to accept whatever commitment level would-be disciples think they can muster up. He is Lord of all, or he is Lord not at all. In the early 21st century, uh, inventor Dean Kamen was working on a top secret invention that was destined to change the world. And he was already known to be a genius for inventing the drug infusion pump, the portable dialysis machine, and the the insulin pump for those who are suffering from diabetes. And so this completely changed the way people live their lives, all the result of his inventions. He is a heavy hitter. He is brilliant. He's a big deal. Now, his new project was so groundbreaking that it was shrouded in extreme secrecy. And because it was secret, the world speculated about what it could be. Eventually... Word leaked out that Cayman's invention would transform urban planning and it would change how human beings chose to live together. It would revolutionize personal transportation, it would reduce pollution, and it would alleviate urban congestion. And so it staggers the imagination. What could it be that he is working on that's going to change uh, everything about the world in which we live. The claims captured the public's imagination, envisioning a future where cities would be transformed. Now, after this point, high-profile nerds like Steve Jobs from Apple and Jeff Bezos from Amazon were said to have seen the project, and they said they were convinced that the world was about to change on the magnitude of how the world changed when we went from horse and buggy to automobiles. I mean, they were hyping this up like you could not believe. So much so that Cayman's company was estimated to be worth billions of dollars before anyone ever knew what he was really working on. So what could it be? Time Magazine read, uh, ran a cover article. What is it? What is it? And, And what could it be? The buzz in the early innocent days of the internet wanted to know what was Cayman working on. And then the day came in 2001 where he finally revealed it. Uh, (laughs) The world had the same reaction you did. In fact, the big reveal took place on Good Morning America, December 3rd, 2001, Charlie Gibson and Diane Sawyer hyped it up with Dean Kamen. They raised the curtain to reveal the segue. Diane Sawyer's reaction is legendary. She says, I'm tempted to say, is that it? (laughs) And the answer was, yep. That's it. The world was underwhelmed. The segue flopped and it's currently out of production. Here's what I'm wondering. Does the unbelieving world listen to us go on and on about Jesus in the Bible and then watch how we live? And is the world underwhelmed as a result? They listen to us. They watch us gather in rooms like this and sing our songs and do all of our stuff and then watch us live our lives throughout the week. And do they wonder, is that it? Is that it? Because it seems like everything else in life is Lord but Jesus. And I wonder what Jesus thinks when he's called us to take up our crosses and follow after him. And then he watches how his, his followers respond to him day in and day out. And I'm wondering if he's thinking, huh. Right? After all the hype, after all the talk, What is the payoff? Is that it? Is that it? 
And I wonder, do I love this world too much to really be a pilgrim in it? Have I made myself at home? And am I seeking out comfort and predictability and consistency in a place I was never meant to be comfortable in? Maybe I need more convenience than Jesus allows. My intentions are good, but when push comes to shove, I am simply going to make choices that benefit me, not the kingdom of God. I am to follow and give myself to Jesus because he is Lord. There is no other Lord. Again, he is Lord of all or he is not or he is Lord not at all. Let me be clear. Jesus cannot and will not follow me as Lord. Jesus does not accommodate me. When I insist on that, when I live like that, I'm the one who is suffering. Jesus is Lord. And I adjust everything that I am to everything that he is. And the question I want to ask is, have I made a commitment of my life worthy of Jesus? Or have I only expected Jesus to commit to me? The second thing I would tell you this morning is that the miracles Matthew mentions here are to remind me of who Jesus is. He is the one with all authority. I am to seek his presence, not his power. And again, this is countercultural to the way church culture in North America encourages you to, to approach the Lord Almighty. And so again, what I'm about to say is not going to sell books in this country. But it needs to be said nonetheless. The purpose of of, of Matthew's narrative here in describing these miracles is Christological. In other words, he is trying to help his readers to understand who Jesus is. And Matthew employs these miracles to help us to understand Jesus' identity as Messiah, as king, as God in the flesh. And with that in mind then, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Well, Matthew tells us, Jesus is the one who has power and authority over nature. And it tells us that a sudden squall rises on the Sea of Galilee. But the way Matthew describes it, this is no ordinary storm. And the boat is in danger, and lives are at risk. And where was Jesus? He was taking a nap. I love it. Sometimes the most Christ-like thing you and I can do is take a nap. (laughs) So he's sleeping. Jesus isn't worried at all. And his disciples rouse him. Matthew's language indicates they're upset. They're scared. They beg for help. Excuse me. In verse 26, they call Jesus Lord. But they are terrified because they think he is not helping them when they need it most. Jesus simply gets up and says, what's wrong with you people? I was sleeping. (laughs) Oh, you of little faith. The disciples were safe because they were with Jesus. Not because Jesus was exercising his power on their behalf. Allow me to say that again. The disciples were safe because they were with Jesus, not because Jesus was exercising his power on their behalf. So Jesus gets up, he rebukes the storm. It's the same term used in all of the stories of exorcism where he rebukes the evil spirits. Immediately there is peace and the disciples are left to wonder, yo, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. But make no mistake, the disciples are rebuked by Jesus because they were desperate for Jesus to calm calm the storm when they were safe all along because Jesus was with them. And I wonder 
if I'm looking, if I'm, if I'm pursuing the wrong thing, when I become desperate for Jesus to calm the storms, when he's with me all along. The next miracle, Jesus is the one who has the power and authority over evil. Jesus and his company arrive on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee and he counters two demonized men, uh, literally demonized. The demonization in, in Greek involves the indwelling of unseen evil spirits in a way that prevents an individual from fully controlling his or her own actions. And so Matthew says that the violence of these demoniacs kept them from the rest of civilization. They lived in tombs. They, uh, nobody could go near them out of threat of violence. The demons in these men acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and they want to know why He is there. And then they use His name, Son of God, seemingly in an attempt to exercise Jesus from their presence. And it's interesting, Matthew says that they say to Him, we know who you are, it's not time yet. Why are you here? In other words, go away. It's not your time. They're trying to exercise Jesus. And then, when they recognize that Jesus is going to cast them out of these men, uh, but he's not going to destroy them totally and utterly, they request a new home. Interesting that pigs were being raised by these Jews there on the Sea of Galilee. Pigs, of course, were considered to be unclean by the Jews. Therefore, this was an appropriate place for the demons to go. And so in verse 32, Jesus says, go, literally he says, you may go, granting them permission to leave these men and to go into those pigs. And so the demons enter into the herd of the pigs. They continue their destructive activity by throwing the swine off the rocky cliffs. Now, the witnesses of this, the farmers, uh, naturally spread the word about what has happened and like the nearby townsfolk uh, they are all distressed for whatever reason Jesus' display of power and authority convinces the people they did not want him around now don't miss this the demons were terrorizing the people who lived there Jesus is the one with authority over evil, but it's no mystery. It's a mystery to me why people in this world often prefer evil. These folks didn't mind disobeying the word of God. They were raising pigs after all. Jesus' presence there was a threat to them and their lifestyle. They seem to be saying, we'll take our demons and pigs. Thank you. Get lost, Jesus. And, and, and I'm, it's just, I see in this country right now, people who prefer their sin and their darkness to the presence of the Lord. Man. Do you? And maybe you would never be this bold, but I wonder how many places in our lives would never see the presence of Jesus because we've protected them in their darkness. Finally, we see that Jesus is the one who has power and authority over sin. And in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 9, Jesus encounters a paralytic. Uh, the sick man is brought on a stretcher like cot by some friends who had faith in Jesus. They brought their needy friend to the presence of the Lord. Now, Matthew does not indicate the spiritual state of the sick man. The paralyzed man says nothing. He asks nothing. And Jesus ignores his physical condition and declares that his sin is forgiven. Now, I want to be clear. In the mind of the Lord God Almighty, the biggest need that every person in this world has is their sin problem. Not their physical problem. Amen. Amen. Too many people are seeking physical healing and miracles when they should be turning away from sin and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus addresses his sin. 
When he does that, in verse 3, he describes mutter among themselves. Jesus has committed blasphemy by claiming the right to do something that only God can do, which is forgive sin. So Jesus knows what they're thinking. And so to justify his behavior, Jesus asks whether it is easier to pronounce a person forgiven or healed. Which one is easier? And obviously it's easier to say his sin's forgiven because nobody knows if that's true or not. But if he says he's healed, it's obvious whether he is or not. And so Jesus says, so that you'll know that I have the power to forgive sin, I'm going to do what appears to be the harder thing, which is to heal him in your presence. And boom, he says, pick up your your mat and go home. And immediately the man gets up and goes home. The crowd, Matthew says, is literally afraid. Probably a word that combines terror and awe, and they glorify God uh, because of the authority that that God has given to Jesus. Here's what I want to tell you. While it is true that I am to turn to Jesus as the one to trust in all circumstances of life, the point of the miracles is to remind me of who Jesus is not what he will do for me. Of course, Jesus can calm the storms in your life. That doesn't mean that he will. My desire is for his presence, not his power. Jesus is Lord and worthy of my worship and trust, regardless of when and how he chooses to use his power in my life. To use Old Testament imagery, I am to seek the Lord's face, not the Lord's hand. Too many people, Christians in our culture, are following Jesus because of what they think they can get out of it instead of following Jesus for who he is. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus knows the difference. And it matters to him. I am to seek his presence, not his power. After Abraham Lincoln became president, before the days of the civil service, office seekers would besiege him from all over the country, trying to get appointments to various federal jobs. Lincoln was the only one who could assign people to those jobs, and so they waited in line for hours at the White House to have a personal audience with the president who would then say yes or no regarding various jobs. Lincoln spent hours each day meeting with people who wanted something from him. The legend goes that on one day, confined to bed with typhoid fever, Lincoln declared to his secretary, bring on the office seekers, I now have something I can give to everybody. (laughs) And I wonder, How many people call themselves followers followers of Jesus, but in reality, they are only creating idols for themselves, idols that will fulfill their desires and justify their lives. And if you're following Jesus because you think you can leverage something from him to make your life easier in this world, you're not really following Jesus the way that he calls. The question I want to ask, am I following Jesus because of who he is or because of what I want him to do for me? Now remember, I'm going back to the beginning of the sermon. Before you went to sleep, I told you that, in my opinion, I am to accept from Jesus the grace of what he has already done for me through his death and resurrection. But I follow him because he is Lord of all. Do you see the difference? Jesus has already done everything for me that I need. Anything else he chooses chooses to do is great. I follow Jesus not to get something from him. I follow him because he is Lord. So this morning, as we close, I'll invite you to consider a couple of different things. First of all, 
I invite you to commit all your life to Jesus. He is worthy of being your Lord. We can't have two masters. There can be only one. Jesus knows the difference. Are you following Jesus as Lord today? Secondly, I invite you to offer your life to Jesus as a loving response to who he is and what he has already done for you through his death and resurrection. What's your motive? Is your motive to honor and glorify God? Is your motive to be safe in the storm? I tell you, friend, you are safe if you're in the presence of the Lord, whether the storms rage or not. The Lord is with you, and that's what you need. Seek his presence, not his power, and everything will be just fine. So I'm going to pray, and then Matthew will come and lead us in this time of response. How do you need to respond to the word of the Lord today? You can do that right where you are while we sing. Uh, If you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. And I'll be standing here if you want to come and pray with me while we're singing. And when the service is over, I'm going to be out in the foyer for a while. If you want to talk to me or ask questions or tell me something, that's where I'll be. I would love to visit with you. So let's pray together. Now, Lord, I, I pray that in my heart and in my mind you would clarify for me my motives, my reasons, my why. What is my why? And I pray that today it would be true that you would be Lord of my life. No more hiding, no more running, no more games, no more uh, fencing off certain areas of my life to remain in darkness. But Lord, I would give you access to all of who I am. And I pray that you would be delighted in how I trust you in all things. Help me, Lord, to trust you enough to seek your presence and not your power. You have already rescued me from my sin. While I'm scared, Lord, I want to be the person who trusts you enough to not demand a rescue from the troubles of this world. Because this world is not my home. So help me enough to have help me to have the faith enough to walk with you through the valley of shadow through the storms in the presence of evil in the presence of the the terrors of this world believing that the day is coming that you will make all things right and all things new In the meantime help me to follow you to walk with you and to remain in your presence from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. And now, Lord, may your spirit be free to move in the lives of these people who are worshiping you today. May your will be accomplished. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.